Good evening, um, and thank you for joining us. Um, on behalf of the panel and the organizer, I'm pleased to welcome you to our cafe. Um, there will be some coffee later, and it will be a real cafe. Right now, you just have to wait for it. And it's hosted by the Lung Association with the support of the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, as we call it CLSA. I know many of you are the participants of the CLSA, and you are here. And also, uh, this event is supported and with, uh, by the Labarge Optimal Aging Initiative and the, and the newly approved uh, uh, McMaster Institute of Geroscience. So what this highlights is that McMaster is becoming an important player in the area of research on aging, and we are going to be showcasing many of those, not only today, but in the future events as well. Uh, my name is uh, Praminder Reyna. I'm the lead principal investigator of uh, Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging and a professor in clinical epidemiology and biostatistics here at McMaster. And I'm going to be your moderator today. I will be the David Letterman. Um, and uh, you will get a chance to hear some of the leaders uh, in the area of lung health. Uh, and, and talk about where the research is, what kind of treatments and uh, management, management issues in relation to lung health uh, they have been uh, working on and what there is to share with all of you here today. And the idea is that they will share the latest knowledge on the topic and how it can help uh, those of you here or people in general uh, in relation to um, in relation to the lung health, thinking about pneumonia, lung cancer, asthma, or COPD. Um, we appreciate all of you taking the time to come out uh, and take part in what we hope will be an informative session. Uh, we are in the virtual world tonight, and uh, we have some people through the webcast online. I think the last number I heard there were around 20 to 30 people online already, and uh, hopefully those people will be able to hear what our experts have to uh, say. And if you, any one of you have access to Twitter, you can tweet it to, what is the tweet, tweet, Twitter address from CLSA? We can use that one. What is it? Yeah, it's at CLSA hashtag. Yeah, it's uh, at CLSA underscore ELCV. So if you can send your question through Twitter, we'll make sure that our panelists are able to address any of your questions. Uh, today's event is also intended to inform you about the Lung Association's Breathing as One Campaign for Lung Research. I wanted to also mention here that this event is actually supported entirely by the Lung Association through their, uh, through their uh, Breathing as One campaign. Lung Association is one of Canada's oldest and most respected health charities with a focus on education, advocacy, support for patients, caregivers, and healthcare providers, and of course, research. It is the focus on the research that is behind Breathing as One campaign for lung research. Those of us here on the stage tonight, especially four of my colleagues here, and I'm sure many of those in the audience as well, know firsthand the challenges and impact on the quality of life for Canadians suffering from respiratory illnesses. And statistics are actually quite daunting. With one in five Canadians affected by lung disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, is becoming number one cause of hospitalization and lung, can and lung cancer uh, kills more people than breast, ovarian, and pr prostate cancer combined. And thinking about these statistics and also thinking about COPD and the aging of our population and the influence of environment and the air pollution, you can see these, some of these issues are going to be magnified in the, in the uh, coming years. And it's also... Uh, important to mention that November is a lung month, so there is no better time to introduce uh, this important new campaign to you here today by our colleagues and by the Lung Association as well. 
And as I mentioned, the CLSA is also part of today's event, and, and we would like to extend special uh, thanks and welcome and thanks to the study participants who are here today. And it's kind of fun to see those people come out again and again, different events that we have hosted here, and see their interest in research and evidence and science, and how that, that will not only impact their own health, but the future generations as well, and how they become ambassadors for some of this uh, research as well. And those of you who are not part of the CLSA and don't know CLSA probably saw the promo that we had earlier on going in the loop form. CLSA is a 20-year longitudinal study, which is recruiting 50,000 men and women between the ages of 45 and 85 across Canada. And so far, we have already recruited uh, almost 45,000 people, so we have 5,000 more to go. And we are looking at science of aging from cell to society. We're trying to understand what the biological aspects of aging are, as well as to the social aspects of aging. And respiratory health actually is an important part of, uh, part of the uh, CLSA. And, uh, and keeping in mind what the Breathing One campaign is trying to achieve, uh, that, that one of the challenges in the lung health research is getting attention given to research in this area. Many of the other areas of health get a lot of funding to do research, and this area actually hasn't received that attention in relation to how the different uh, research, re uh, the, the financial resources be given to conduct research in this area, and we hope Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging is one such platform to enhance uh, research in this area. So rather than me taking up a longer time on describing what CLSA is, you can go to our website and there are brochures and other information here that you can uh, pick up. Uh, tonight, you will hear from some excellent researchers whose work is helping Canadians live longer and live healthier lives. And, and Hamilton has long been a leader in the field of research into lung disease and its treatment. And tonight's guests are an example of the cutting edge work that happens in this area here. Breathing as one campaign will help these investigators and many more like them across Canada get the support and funding they need to create the breathing breakthroughs uh, we all desperately need. And I guess one of the roles as you community member is to make sure you talk to your members of parliament saying that how important this area of research is that the, what the federal government or the provincial government should be doing in this area from the perspective of uh, research dollars. You'll also hear about some of the programs the Lung Association offers to help those with respiratory illnesses. Today's event will consist of 10 minute presentation from each one of our four panelists, after which we will open up to questions from the floor, so you have the opportunity to ask questions, and hopefully we sort of have an interactive dialogue around different areas. You can pose your question in general terms, or you can ask a specific questions to one of the uh, speakers. And then we will wrap up the official part of the program just before 7 p.m., after which you are in, invited to stay and enjoy some of the light refreshments and perhaps mingle with some of the speakers and ask more questions if some of you are shy and don't want to ask the question in public. So I don't want to take up too much more time and I'd like to introduce our panelists here. What I will do is I'll introduce all four of them now and then they will come to the podium and start presenting. First we have uh, Dr. Don Bodish an associate professor in the Department of Pathology and Molecular Medicine at McMaster. Dawn is a holder of the Canada Research Chair in Aging and Immunity. Uh, she earned her PhD at the University of British Columbia and her work there led to a patent and the formation of a small biotech company, which I didn't know, Dawn. Great job. She joined McMaster in 2009 and her laboratory here conducts research into some of the major causes of pneumonia in the uh, aging population. And, and she has greatly benefited through Lung Association in getting funding for her work in her laboratory. So Dawn will be one of our first speakers. Our second speaker will be Carol Madeline. 
and Director of Respiratory Health Programs from Ontario Lung Association. She is responsible for the delivery of several asthma programs funded by Ontario Ministries of Health and Long-Term Care, as well as a Breathe Works program funded by the Lung Association and other respiratory programs that are offered across the province. Welcome, Carol. Uh, next, we have uh, Dr. Carl Richards, a professor in, uh, at McMaster University as part of the McMaster Immunological Research Center. He studies tissue remodeling, which is a feature of many lung diseases, and how the lung copes with chronic inflammation. He's, uh, he has also developed a mouse model of a lung cancer and is using this to develop no novel therapeutics for difficult to treat lung cancers. Welcome, Carl. And our final presenter of the evening is uh, Dr. Gerard, Gerard Cox, a physician for more than 25 years who, has, who joined McMaster in 1992, trained both in internal medicine and respiratory medicine, and is a former head of clinical services at the Firestone Institute for Respiratory Health at St. Joseph's Hospital here in Hamilton. In addition to providing clinical care from respiratory illnesses, Dr. Cox is also active in research on the mechanisms and management of pulmonary inflammation. So welcome, Jared. And, uh, and you can see that we have people here that range from what happens in the laboratory side to what happens from the programming side to what happens when a physician interacts with a, a patient who is suffering from a particular uh, lung health issue, and you will hear all their perspective. So without wasting any more time, I will turn the podium over to Dawn. Dawn, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. I've been working with the Lung Association in their Breathing as One campaign, and it's been such a thrill for me to be able to uh, speak and help to raise awareness and to raise money for a cause that's both professionally very important to me, because it, obviously it's my research interest, but also is personally very important to me, because I have a number of older adults in my life who I care deeply about, and I want them to remain healthy for a long time. In fact, you may even recognize me from some of the promotional materials from the, from the Lung Association. Um, my lab's vision is that keeping older adults infection-free would provide them with more years of independence, improve the quality of life, and reduce the cost of care. And it is very common to blame aging for driving up the cost of our health care system. So on the left, what you're looking at here is a common bar chart that says how many dollars per year each age group uh, costs. And you can see that that increases as you get older. Um, but in fact, it's not aging that's expensive. It's aging and ill health. So on the right-hand side, what you're looking at is a graph from the province of Alberta where they looked at individuals who are over 65 and how much they cost the health care system. And you can see that people in green who have no uh, chronic inflammatory diseases, no real medical conditions, cost very little. In fact, they cost less than a pregnant woman. And no one ever blames them for driving up health care costs. Um, even if you have a few risk factors, maybe a family history or um, uh, obesity or smoking, if you're not currently sick, you're in that yellow bar there. And again, you don't cost very much. But this is what becomes expensive. If you have a chronic inflammatory condition like diabetes, COPD, heart disease, or God forbid more than one of them, this is what is expensive. Aging isn't uh, expensive aging and ill health is. And so my lab really wants to prevent or delay or stop or slow down the onset of these chronic inflammatory diseases. And something that you might not be aware of is that pneumonia can actually be a driver of some of the, these things that uh, cause us to have ill health as we get older. And so I'll give you an example. This is some data that's been collected from American uh, HMOs and their Medicaid system. They know that if two older adults go to the hospital for the, any of the things that an older adult might go to the hospital for, let's say they go for a heart attack, if one of those people acquires a pneumonia around the time of their stay, that person is going to cost an additional $15,000 in the next year for health care costs. And those health care costs aren't going to be related to the pneumonia, and they're not going to be related to whatever uh, they originally went to 
the hospital for. This is because having a pneumonia in mid to late life can sort of accelerate or exacerbate uh, the development of other chronic inflammatory conditions that might seem quite unrelated. And to me, this is a terrifying graph. So these HMOs have tracked people for a few years after they've left the hospital, and they've grouped them into two groups, people who acquired a pneumonia at the same time that they were ill, and people who didn't acquire a pneumonia. Everyone leaves the hospital healthy in this study. But uh, over time, what happens is they're looking at the death rate, and so if you didn't have a pneumonia, the death rate is shown there in gray. If you are unfortunate enough to have a pneumonia during your stay in hospital, the death rate is much steeper. These people die a lot. And this is all-cause mortality. This isn't because of pneumonia. Nobody dies in, of pneumonia in Canada uh, anymore unless they're very, very ill and frail. This is because this pneumonia can precipitate or accelerate other chronic inflammatory diseases, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and dementia being the big ones. So preventing pneumonia in mid to late life will hopefully slow down or stop the, the uh, progression to some of these diseases. And what my lab is studying is the strange cyclical relationship between chronic inflammation and chronic inflammatory diseases, pneumonia, and having an acute uh, inflammatory response. So for reasons that we don't really understand very well, if you've already got a chronic inflammatory disease, dementia, diabetes, and cardiovascular being the big ones, you're more predisposed to getting a pneumonia. And then if you get a pneumonia, the natural immune response that you have, the natural inflammatory response that you have that gives you the fever and makes you feel sick and, and is actually a very beneficial part to, cure, to, to um, getting better from that pneumonia, doesn't seem to go away the way it should be. And so that acute inflammatory response that comes around the time that you're ill uh, seems to build up or raise these levels of inflammation that we have in our body and might um, cause th this acceleration or exacerbation of other chronic inflammatory diseases. So what my lab's really doing is we're trying to find breaks in this cycle. We're trying to find places where we can stop um, this terrible progression. Now inflammation, which you may or may not know, is actually a natural part of aging. So on the left here, what we're looking at is um, some blood donors who came to our lab and gave blood. And I would encourage all you to do that as well if you're not tapped out from being in the CLSA. Um, and what we are looking at, he at here are a number of uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines. It doesn't matter what they are. But basically, these are just measures of inflammation in the blood of the volunteers who come to our lab. And these are young people, old people, young people, old people, young people, old people. And what you can see, no matter what measure of inflammation we look at, and there's a lot, older adults always have more than younger adults. And in fact, this happens in a very linear and predictable way. So if you were to come and donate your blood for me, and I were to uh, ask you what your age is, I could actually, without, if you lied, say, or maybe you were a little bit uh, uh, subtle about how old you actually were, I could actually predict your age within three years just by measuring the levels of inflammation in your blood. That's how linear and protective it is. But if I were to do this study and you were to come and give me your blood, you would want to be someone who looks young for their age. You would want to be someone who falls below that line, and you would want to be someone who is lower than average. You'd want me to guess you were young and not just for vanity. Because having lower than age average levels of information tends to mean you're going to have a longer, healthier life and be less plagued by some of these chronic inflammatory diseases. And as it turns out, you'd be protected from pneumonia as well. So like I said, we're trying to really figure out why there's this strange relationship between chronic inflammatory diseases, inflammation, and pneumonia. And what we do is we take a certain kind of white blood cell out of the blood, or we use aged mice. So we use mice that are about two years old, which are about an 80-year-old 80, 80 equivalent. And we take a certain kind of white blood cell out of their um, uh, our blood or their blood um, called a macrophage. And the macrophage's job is basically it's the Pac-Man of the immune system. It goes and it chomps the bacteria and it destroys it. And so what we found, and unfortunately the, the screen isn't very clear here, but the macrophage is, is yellow and the bacteria is red. And what happens is the macrophage throws out its arms, engulfs that bacteria, and blows it to smithereens. So you can't actually see a bacteria in there anymore, you just see a red haze. Now this is a macrophage from an older individual, and what's happened here, unfortunately, is the, bacteria, the macrophage has been able to eat the bacteria, but it can't uh, kill it. 
And so what we found is that old macrophages essentially lose their appetite for bacteria. They're not very good at eating and killing them anymore. But if we experimentally in our mouse models, if we lower that age-associated inflammation using drugs or genetics, what we can actually do is restore that appetite so they keep their killing capacity. So we've been able to use this as a way of um, studying how uh, reducing inflammation uh, helps. The other thing we've noticed is that um, when we take these macrophages out, they, have, they produce way more inflammation than they need. So in the pink bar, what we're doing is we're measuring the difference between the pink, which are old macrophages, and orange, which are young macrophages, and we see that those old macrophages produce way too much inflammation for what they need. And for reasons that we don't understand, it's not really very well um, resolved. And so we think that's what contributes to this cycle. So in our lab, we're trying three basic approaches to make um, old people have long, older adults have longer, healthier lives. We're developing new drugs. For example, we just identified that this compound here can restore the appetites of, of macrophages, and we're really interested in bringing that to animal models. We're actually trying to use drugs that are natural anti-inflammatories to see if we can reduce inflammation in our mouse models, and if we can bring those levels back down to what they were when uh, the mice were young, and see if all of a sudden that can repair their their um, macrophage function. And we're also trying to use uh, probiotics and other tools to sort of strengthen the microbial communities that will prevent the bacteria that causes pneumonia from really seeding hold. So that's what I'm doing, and here's what you can do. So the first and most important thing is always managing any chronic inflammatory conditions. The better health you have, the less chance of getting a pneumonia you have. The second thing is to be aware of the symptoms. So Pneumonia is a bit of a strange uh, uh, infection to have. In young adults or kids, raging fevers. In older adults, sometimes those fevers are, ad, uh, are absent. And so people will often complain of being run down or having a tightness of chest, um, but they might not have a really, really strong fever response. So if for any reason you suspect that you're just feeling a little under the weather or, some, or um, uh, feeling that tightness in the chest, it's important to get that looked at. Pneumonia is a serious infection and it doesn't go away. And we have two vaccinations that can help prevent this. We have the pneumococcal vaccine or the pneumonia vaccine, and we have an influenza vaccine because pneumonia often comes with influenza. But it's important not just to get yourselves vaccinated. In my family, we make vaccination a family affair because the number one risk factor for older adults for getting pneumonia is contact with children. So those little angels look very sweet, but in fact, what they are are breeding grounds for the pneumonia that will infect their, their grandparents. So for dollar for dollar, vaccination actually works better in children, if you were to only uh, vaccinate two of the people in this picture, uh, the under five crowd would be the one to do it with. Nevertheless, in my family, we're all vaccinated. And so essentially, this is why my work is important to me on a personal level. It's not only because keeping older adults healthy and infection free would provide them with more years of independence, improve the quality of life, and reduce the cost of care, but more importantly, it's because it will give them more years of playing with their grandkids, and really, that's what we all want. Um, so I'd just like to acknowledge the hard work of my team at the McMaster Immunology Research Center and our collaborators who help us do this, and I'm really looking forward to entertaining your questions during the question period and meeting you at the coffee break. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. My name is Carol Maidley and I work for the Ontario Lung Association. I'm going to be speaking to you tonight about chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. COPD includes chronic bronchitis and emphysema. It's a lung disease that takes your breath away. And the main symptoms are cough, shortness of breath, and sputum production. Approximately 13% of Canadians have COPD, and its prevalence is increasing, especially in women. So approximately 13% of Canadians have COPD. That's millions of Canadians. It's a major cause of death and disability. It's the fourth leading cause of death in Canada, and it's expected to be the third leading cause of death by 2020. It causes more hospitalizations than any other chronic illness. This is a serious disease. It doesn't usually affect people under the age of 40, so it's commonly an older person's uh, lung disease. It affects more women than men. 
Women are more susceptible to the harmful effects of tobacco smoke, and women develop COPD earlier than men. So why do people get COPD? What are the causes? Well, 80 to 90% of the cause is from cigarette smoking, but there are about 10 or 20% that are caused from other factors, like a genetic factor called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. It could be due to your occupation. Maybe you are exposed to different chemicals at work. It could be due to long-term secondhand smoke exposure and a, a child that had several lung infections. So uh, here's a quick ass self-assessment test. If you're over the age of 40 and you smoke or you used to smoke, you may have COPD. But take this quick test. Do you cough regularly? Do you cough up phlegm regularly? Do even simple chores make you short of breath? Do you wheeze when you exert yourself or at night? Do you get frequent colds that persist longer than those of other people you know? If you answered yes, to one or more of these questions, ask your healthcare provider about a spirometry test. Now, a spirometry test is a simple breathing test. You can often get it at a, a doctor's office, a hospital lab, a clinic. What they'll ask you to do is take a really, really big breath in and blow the air out hard and fast and keep blowing and blowing until your lungs feel like they're empty. It's the test that we use to help confirm a diagnosis of COPD or asthma. I just want to add one thing about that spirometry test. Some of you may have been told you have COPD. But you may have been told you have COPD based on your smoking history and your symptoms. However, to be sure you have COPD, ask for spirometry. And having that spirometry test will also help your healthcare provider to make sure that you're on the proper medications you need for your COPD. So how do we manage this lung disease called COPD? Well, if you're smoking, find a way to quit. And it's not, I know it's very, very tough. And you, there's many, many ways that out there to help you quit. And sometimes you need more than one. You might need nicotine replacement therapy and some support. Find a way to quit. Quitting smoking is the best way to slow down the progression of this lung disease. The other thing you want to do is stay away from things that make your lung dis that make your symptoms worse. So for instance, as Dawn mentioned, if your children or grandchildren are suffering with a cold, if they've got the flu, don't visit at that time. Say sorry, don't come, don't come see me this week. Also air pollution can make your symptoms worse. And if you are prescribed medications, it's important to take them as prescribed. I can't tell you the number of times I'll say to somebody, are you using that medication? And they'll, and they'll tell me what they're doing with it. And I'll say, now pick it up and read to me what it says. And they're often not doing what it says. Take your medications as prescribed. And in the treatment of COPD, the medication is often inhalers. Exercise is really important for all of us. Regular exercise is very beneficial for people that have COPD. You might want to do mall walking. You might have stationary cycle. It's important to keep, to keep healthy. To control your breathlessness and reduce fatigue, you need to learn strategies. And for instance, there's breathing techniques like purse-lip breathing. You also want to prevent and treat flare-ups. Flare-ups are what makes your symptoms worse. So work with your healthcare provider on what we call the COPD action plan so that you understand what to do, what kind of action to take when your symptoms are worse. You might have heard of pulmonary rehabilitation. It's a program that helps with energy conservation, exercise training, nutrition counseling, and it'll also help you manage your lung disease. It's extremely important to avoid getting infections. So, as Don mentioned, get the flu shot. Everyone should get the flu shot. 
And the pneumonia vaccine is very important for people who are at high risk. People with lung disease are at high risk. So talk to your family doctor or your healthcare provider about the pneumonia vaccine. Some people require long-term oxygen therapy, not everyone, but some do. And again, I have to stress, get that action plan to help you manage your disease. So what's new in COPD? Well, this year, several new medications and devices have come out for the treatment of COPD. We haven't seen a new inhaled device, uh, sorry, a new inhaled medication for COPD in over 10 years. So this is really exciting. There's a lot of new medications that have come out. And you'll notice a lot of these new medications are called bronchodilator, bronchodilator, bronchodilator. You'll see that along this list. Some of them are combination therapies. Some of them are long acting. Why bronchodilators? That's because it's the mainstay therapy of for COPD. People need bronchodilators to help with their breathlessness. So as you'll see, there's also new devices that have come out this year. New devices we've never heard about before. Breeze Hailer, Ellipta, Genuair, Respimat for the Combivent. So new devices, new medications. Extremely important that if you're placed on one of these new medications that you are in, get the instruction on how to use this new medication. Speak to your pharmacist, your healthcare provider. Taking medications the right way and as prescribed is very important in the management of COPD. What else is new? Well, our, the, there's recently been released new guidelines for the treatment of what we call AECOPD, acute exacerbation of COPD. What is that word, acute exacerbation? It's an acute worsening of your symptoms beyond what you have day to day. Increased shortness of breath, increased cough and sputum production, and you have an increased need to be taking your medications. It's also referred to as a lung attack because, sorry, it's also referred to as a lung attack because like a heart attack, a lung attack is very serious. So these new guidelines for managing acute exacerbations of COPD are now available. They've come out recently. And this will help your doctors, your healthcare providers with the management of an acute exacerbation and with the medications and the antibiotics that are needed. I'd like to take a few seconds here to speak to you about our BreathWorks program. BreathWorks is a national program across this country that all the lung associations have resources, free resources for people with COPD. We also have certified respiratory educators on a helpline. The number that you see here is our national helpline number, 1-866-717-COPD. Or you can also email us at info at on lung.ca. If you get on a new medication, a new device, you've been newly diagnosed, or you have questions about COPD, contact the Lung Association and speak to a certified respiratory educator. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to speak to the Café Scientifique tonight as part of the Breathing as One initiative. My name is Carl Richards, and I'm going to be speaking to you day, today about lung cancer. Now, there's no question that lung cancer is a big killer. So on the uh, left of your screen is a big pie chart here. 30% of people in Canada will die of cancer. Of that 30% in the purple pie chart, 27% will actually die of lung cancer. So it's a really big killer. 
is caused by a rapid growth of these lung tumors in the lungs. There's very few treatments that actually exist for lung cancer, and it's got a very, very low survival rate. On the uh, right-hand side of your screen, I show a CT scan. I'm sure many of you have seen these before. This is a very fancy x-ray showing a cross-section of the thorax. The two dark uh, uh, sections there are, of course, of lung. And you can see, I think, with a purple line, a tumor actually being detected by CT scans. Generally speaking, um, it's very difficult to detect lung cancer. That's one of the main reasons why, in fact, it's very difficult to treat because it progresses so far before, in fact, it's actually detected. Cancer, lung cancer, like all cancers, are actually caused by mutations. And these mutations in cells cause cancer cells to grow uncontrollably. If, in fact, they are not held in check by the immune system, then those cancer cells will develop into a tumor, take over the actual organ, and then, of course, metastasize to other parts of the body where they destroy tissue and take up nutrients. There is increasing evidence to suggest that inflammation not only is caused by cancer, but actually helps cancer develop. And this inflammation can come in all different sorts of shapes and flavors. So for example, the inflammation that you get from a broken arm or trauma, of heat, swelling, and pain, is different than the inflammation that you get, for example, if you have allergic airway disease, where you have coughing and wheezing, and is different than the actual inflammation that you get in autoimmune disease, where you get destruction, for example, of bones and cartilage. There is also a cancer-promoting inflammation, and that's what we, in our lab, are trying to actually study in more detail. So quickly about lung cancer mortality. I'm sure some of you have actually seen these data before, but I want you to point, to point out to you the actual blue line up top here, which shows lung cancer. So on the top is males. Lung cancer mortality over the last 30 years. So this is now from... Um, 1985 through 2014 is very high in comparison to, th to the two lower lines there which are colorectal and prostate cancer. On the bottom are female uh, rates of mortality and you can see in the green line actually that female um, uh, lung cancer is increasing over the last 20 or 30 years so now that in fact it is actually the highest killer of women twice as high at least as opposed to breast cancer or lung cancer. And some of these numbers here are actually, to me, quite remarkable. Uh, 26,000 Canadians will be diagnosed this year with lung cancer. 20,000 20, will die from it. And for me, as I go throughout my <coughs> baby boomer years longitudinally, uh, these numbers for me were, were remarkable. One in 12 of my Canadian uh, um, men on the hockey team are actually going to develop lung cancer and 85% of those will actually die. And there's similar numbers in women. One in 14 Canadian women are expected to develop lung cancer during their lifetime. So it's very, very common. And the other thing associated with that is it's very low survival rate. So I hope you can see it, but these yellow line right at the bottom here is the survival rate for lung cancer at one, three, five, and 10 years after diagnosis. And you can see that even after one year, only 40% of people survive lung cancer. At five years, 17% survive. And at 10 years, only 13% of people diagnosed with lung cancer survive. At 10 years. You can see these other cancers, prostate cancer, right at the top, blue, much higher percentage uh, survival rate. Female breast cancer, 82% survival rate at the 10 year mark. Despite this major killer activity of lung cancer, the funding that goes into lung cancer research is two to three times lower than it is, for example, in breast cancer. And that's the same in the US as it is in Canada. The early detection is very difficult, as you can imagine. You don't really have feelings in your lungs, so in fact, things can grow in your lungs without any detection for a very long period of time. And that's part of the reason why, in fact, lung cancer uh, is so advanced by the time it's detected. Uh, risk factors, as Carol pointed out, same as COPD. Smoking is, is related to 85% of lung cancers. 
So there's 15% of lung cancers that are not related to smoking, but no question uh, heed Carol's <coughs> advice if in fact you are a smoker. Uh, the um, other, the current treatments are of course surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and more recently these uh, biologic therapies called targeted therapy where they actually target specific molecules, and I'll talk about that in just a second. And even more recently are immunotherapy approaches where in fact the, the approach is to jack up the activity of the immune system in order to attack cancer but I won't have time to talk to you about that today. So how does cancer grow in the lungs? Uh, this is a schematic diagram on your right showing a cell. A cell is actually activated by growth factors and those growth factors interact at cell surface receptors. For example, this one is called the EGF receptor. And what happens after that is a whole series of events inside the cell that t tells the cell to grow. If, in fact, uh, these proteins here are mutated so that they're constantly turned on, the cell gets the message to continue to proliferate at, uh, um, forever. So this is the problem with most cancers and that there is mutations in these molecules and these growth factor receptors that cause the cell to turn on its proliferation. And here you can see a couple of tumor, uh, tumor cells here dividing in two. So there's mutations that cause the lung cancer, uh, but also in the lung is a very rich environment for the actual tumors to grow. And uh, those mutations have actually been uh, looked at over time. Uh, this is uh, examples from 1984 through to the present time of trying to define those, those particular mutations. And the reason is, is that you can actually develop medications to target individual mutations. And that's the goal. But you can see in 1984, for example, on the top left-hand side, there was only one mutation that was identified. It was called KRAS. Through 2004, 2009, and on the bottom right in 2013, in lung cancer now, we know what the mutations are in 65% of individuals. And that helps with us trying to decide, particularly med uh, oncologists, trying to decide which medications that patients might be more responsive to compared to others. So uh, that's the mutation side of things. I'm, I'm not a mutational biologist, I am an inflammologist. And I'm really interested in how the inflammation actually causes the cancer to grow. And the cancer cells don't actually grow uh, in uh, a vacuum. There's other cells, macrophages and fibroblasts and immune cells that are all actually intermixed into the tumor so that 50% of the tumor is actually non-tumor cells. And those cells, I believe, are instrumental in developing the actual cancer growth. And they can be controlled by different stimulus uh, of, of uh, inflammation. So here's an example. I'll only show you two data slides. This is one of them. This is one of my most favorite. And these are mouse lungs. So I work in mouse. Like Don, I work in mouse. And <clears throat> um, on the left-hand slide are mouse lungs that have been treated with a tumor. And on the bottom there is a, what's called a histological slide where you can actually see under the microscope where the tumors are. The next slide over is where we change and skew the environment with this growth factor. It's called OSM. It's a growth factor that actually skews the inflammatory environment to increase the tumors there 50 to 100 fold. Okay? We can also follow these by CT scans. And if you look at that on the far right hand side, you can see those what we call heat maps, identifying tumors there that are shown in red. We can follow this system in animals over time using these CT scans analysis. The other thing that we've done, and this is only the second data slide that I'll show you, is we've looked at a model of KRAS mutations in mice because in fact KRAS here represents 25% of the, of the mutations in lung cancer. And when we take a mouse and we activate a mutant KRAS gene in the mouse and follow it by CT scans, you can see in the middle here that you can see in two different mice dramatic increases in these tumors. If you combine that mouse with one that has reduced function of this growth factor that I'm talking about, you can get a dramatic decrease in the amount of tumors. 
So that is what we're trying to understand. How is this working? And this growth factor we hear is actually called OSM, maybe affecting immune system or maybe affecting the regulation of these non-tumor cells. And that we, we believe will be a new approach to tackling these very, very difficult to handle uh, human tumors. And with that, I'd like to finish and make sure I recognize the work of one individual, Sean Lauber here is a student who is primarily responsible for some of this work. And uh, thank you for your attention. So I'm Jerry Cox and I'm going to talk to you about another lung disease, this is pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, this is an illness that uh, doesn't affect as many people as the illnesses you've heard about already today, but it is a rather devastating illness, almost as bad as lung cancer in its outlook, and unfortunately it's an illness that becomes more common as we age, so that while I started in this condition 30 odd years ago uh, studying it, um, and then it was rather uncommon. Uh, nowadays, it's not that uncommon at all uh, because people are living longer and surviving many other insults and they're getting this. So this is a disease of the lung tissue. You heard about COPD which is, and bronchitis, and which is predominantly an illness of the airway or the breathing tubes. But pulmonary fibrosis is an illness of the lung tissue where the gas exchange, where gas exchange occurs. And uh, so this affects all around the outside of the lung, not the breathing tubes. So we know about breathing tube disease, asthma, bronchitis, which can be caused by a variety of different factors here. COPD that we've heard presented already and bronchiectasis might be another one. The interstitial lung diseases are a lot less common and they've got much longer names and they're not in the least bit intuitive when you hear the names. Apart from pulmonary fibrosis, the first one, with the commonest form of that being of unknown cause, so we call it idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which basically means we don't know what's caused your lung scarring. It can be caused by radiation exposure, and we, of course we use a lot of radiation treatment for other cancers, and we are all exposed to radiation as long as we live around uh, anywhere. And if you go up in the, an airplane, you're exposed to more. And if you live in the city, you're exposed to more than you live in the country. And the interstitial lung diseases can be caused by drugs that are used to treat other conditions. So quite a number of our patients are people who have survived another condition, but unfortunately the treatments have caused lung injury and lung fibrosis, and we're left treating with that. Just to make the counterpoint the opposite, emphysema, which is also an illness of of the lung tissue is actually destruction of it. So you've got absence of lung tissue and emphysema and big holes in the lung and big spaces where lung tissue used to exist. Whereas lung fibrosis is an illness where the tissue becomes denser and stronger. And there's a normal scaffolding in the lung to give it some structure and to give it some flexibility. And there, so there is normal fibrous tissue, but not so much of it and it's loosely connected so it's flexible. Unfortunately, when we get an overaccumulation of fibrous tissue in, in scarring diseases, it gets stiffer. And you can imagine that if these walls get, get bigger and stronger and thicker, there's going to be less space between them. And that's exactly what happens. The lungs become stiff and the spaces become smaller so there's less room for air. We can detect this on the chest x-ray. On the left, we can see a normal chest x-ray where, as Carl said, the lung fields are all black, the big white blob in the center is your heart shadow. Contrast that with the x-ray on the right where you see all these markings, all these extra white blobs and blebs in the, in the lungs. And this represents an excess of lung tissue getting in the way of gas, so it impedes gas exchange, making the lungs stiffer so it becomes harder to take a, a full breath in. Again, the CT scan is a more sensitive technique for demonstrating this, and we have a horizontal or transverse section of the thorax with the heart shadow at the front, the spine at the back, and we can see a normal study on your left where there are some lines and some blobs for blood vessels in the normal lungs. In contrast, on the right-hand side, there's quite a lot of extra white markings, and we see that things are not quite even and dispersed. 
Uh, there's clumps of things in places around the edges. There's a bit of a nice black space here. And on the other side, on the right lung field over there, there's a, quite a lot of disease. When we talk about these changes, we use a term honeycombing. So a honeycomb is shown on the right, nice regular walls with spaces. And we think that that term is a good way of describing what happens in this disease where we see over here. These sort of little, little black spaces with white walls representing the characteristic manifestation of this disease on a CT scan. So honeycombing is something we often talk about to describe it. On the right, we see lung cancer survival rates, and the red line is for 50% survival. And as Carl pointed out, that unless you've got very early stage cancer, which would be stage 1A, you really have very poor outlook with lung cancer. Pulmonary fibrosis isn't a whole lot better. The 50% survival for pulmonary fibrosis is less than four years. So it's a modest improvement over having cancer, and yet people don't treat fibrosis with the same respect and fear that we have for lung cancer. So, where is this coming from? And this is going to bring together, in fact, a number of things you've heard about already. So, what happens in, in pulmonary fibrosis is really in determined by the individual and their journey. What we think happens is that the lining of the lung, which is epithelium, so the lining of the lung gets damaged by a whole variety of things. And this happens always. We're, we're damaging the lining of our lung right now by breathing. There are particles, there are ion, there's things in the atmosphere, there are little infecting organisms, there's pollution, there's smoke, and we deal with it. It's not a problem. But sooner or later, you've, you've had too many little insults, or you may have a little sensitivity, or you may get two or three of them all at the same time. So what we think happens is that there's just a build-up of these micro-injuries, or a little sensitivity on the person's part to them, which leads then to too much damage occurring. And when there's too much damming and failure to repair, you get this chronic ongoing effort to, to heal, and that's where we get too much scar tissue. Scar tissue is a normal part of healing, and we're seeing too much of it. So it's over-enthusiastic efforts to heal. And it can be provoked by infection, like Don talked about. It can be provoked by cigarette smoking, like Carol talked about. It can be provoked by, by inflammation, some inflammatory injury that's either spontaneous in the body or provoked by some other stimulus. Any of these can cause excessive healing. And that's where we come to this idea about how there's a genetic defect or mutation, so that's what Carl talked about a lot, where there's a, a, a fault in the recipe. So, the genes are basically the recipes that your cells follow, and if there's a fault in the recipe, it's making bad stuff. And that causes stress. And unfortunately, the lung is, has to open and close every time you breathe, and that mechanical stress itself can, over years, build up and create some damage that leads to more need for injury and more fibrosis. And these wonderful terms that other people understand telomere shortening, mitochondrial fatigue, cell senescence. What that basically means, these are some of the processes that we all look forward to as we get old. These are some of the events going on in cells that are getting just a bit tired and getting a bit knocked up from being around for a few decades. And that's sort of inevitable for most of us. But there are events that occur in cells as they get old that we can identify and hopefully, like Don talked about, be able to modify by using either new drugs or old drugs or food or goodness knows what to try and interrupt this cycle of buildup of damage as it occurs as cells get older. Unfortunately, as a result of this injury, this genetic tendency, these cell processes that are disturbed, we get in fibrosis remodeling with excess enzymes provoking things to be made, and in particular in excess of matrix or fibrous tissue being put down. So this is just 
I probably, well, you probably could read it, but it doesn't really matter. What this is, this is some of the excitement. This is when we talk about some of these cell processes that are getting upset as we get old and getting upset as a result of repeated injury. There are now examples of different, of, of different types of, of factors. So there's six different things here. Epigenetic changes, signaling pathways, pathways, it doesn't matter what they are, but within these groups there are specific examples being identified which will become targets for intervention and that's what's tremendously exciting, that we may be able in time to stop this consequence of aging and the accumulation, this, 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 this two-sided process, the cells are getting older, they're getting hurt and we can stop some of the accumulated damage that occurs. So just to talk a little bit about pulmonary fibrosis, this is a slide that shows that the, the lung function deteriorates progressively as this illness carries on. And there are two red arrows there, and this is where we might be able to intervene. One is at the gradual decline that occurs, that's arrow number one. And number two is to try and reduce the frequency which people get acute deteriorations or exacerbations. You've heard about the importance of avoiding infection because infections can provoke these illnesses, as well as treating reflux, cause, which causes aspiration, and where necessary oxygen, as Carol said. And the exciting part of pulmonary fibrosis now is that there are two drugs available to us that will reduce the fibrotic process. These have, one is approved in Canada, perfenidone or esbriate. The other, nintedinib, has been approved in the, in the States and in Europe, and will come to Canada sometime soon. Very briefly, profenadone is not an inhibitor of inflammation, but it is an inhibitor of fibrosis. And we know that in the placebo-treated arm of this study, we saw exactly what we expected, which is that there was a decline in the vital capacity, a decline in the breathing capacity. And that's in the white bar. The blue bar shows that that decline was cut in half by drug treatment. This was the first time ever that we showed an effective treatment for fibrosis to prevent deterioration. There's also a small but detectable improvement in the mortality rates, so this is very exciting going forward. The other drug, which is an inhibitor of some of these signaling pathways that Carl referred to, so how does a cell respond to a growth factor? Well, it has an internal signaling system, and those internal signals can be inhibited by this drug. And we see in the far right that the rate of decline, the yellow bar on the right, the rate of decline in patients treated with the highest dose of this compound, that rate of decline again was less than half of what happened in the placebo group or control group shown in white. And nicely too, the incidence of acute exacerbations can be cut in half or even reduced further by successful treatment with this drug. So while IPF is a potentially deadly disease, we now have drugs that can slow progression. However, we're not finished. We need treatments that might actually improve people who have lung fibrosis, not just stop them from deteriorating. And we need new ideas, or we have lots of new ideas. We need the opportunity to test these ideas to show how we can reduce the interaction between aging and the consequences of, of, of the general deterioration that occurs because of living and prevent those two coming together to cause this disease. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Mike McHugh. I participated in the longitudinal study, and I think I'd done extremely well, except when it came to the breathing test, where you have to breathe in the, I think it looked about a three-inch tube, you know, and you, you mentioned that. Well, I couldn't do it. I tried, but, you know, it's, I wondered why it's so big. I really never gave any mind until I listened to the four speakers, and now I'm getting concerned about it, you know. <laughs> So is there anything you can do, you know, to improve your breathing health? I mean, I, I'm not too active, I must say, I must admit that. So the result of your breathing test would be of substantial interest because we heard from Carol that without a spirometry or breathing test, we don't know if a person has got obstructive airways disease or COPD. And the symptoms of COPD, cough and shortness of breath, are very similar to the ones, they're the symptoms of lung fibrosis, which is a very different disease and has very different treatments. So without an accurate measurement, that spirometry or breathing test, we wouldn't begin to know A, is there actually something wrong, and B, what that is and how we might manage it. So my advice to you would be to get a breathing test done 
properly in a, in a proper facility and let's see what the results are. That's not an expensive test actually, it's a cheaper than a chest x-ray. Uh, which lots of people have for investigating lung conditions. There are, however, very innocent technical reasons why you may not have had a good performance on the breathing test. A certain percentage of people can't do breathing tests just because of the coordination that's required to get the test done. It's necessary to form a proper seal with whatever it is you're blowing into, and it's important to coordinate what you're, what you're doing and when you're doing it. And as I say, a number of people who don't have any breathing problems at all can have um, a poor result in a breathing test for technical concerns. So it's important to exclude those before we get too worried about illnesses. Carol. I was just going to add in relation to your experience with the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, uh, it might be that you might have taken a few tries to get the reading. If we were able to get the reading, there is a summary result that we give you saying well, whether you're normal or right. abnormal. You, you try it about three or four times and yeah. if you don't do it in the three or four times, you know, then you yeah. just we, move we on. We stop because uh, in that case you were not able to perform. And I think as Dr. Cox said, that it might be helpful for you to see your physician to see I'm if there is an that. issue. Thanks very much. Carol, you wanted to? Well, I just wanted to add that oftentimes we ask people to not take their medications, their inhaled medications before the breathing test, and maybe you're in a position where you really do need to take your breathing medications, and we may have to, you, you take your medications, but then you let the person know that, yes, I did have to take my medications, and maybe that will help you get through the test. Because we do say to people, well, stop taking your inhaled medications for the test. And maybe that could be the case. Could be, but I really had no uh, breathing problems before. You know, I, I feel I can walk uh, 10 miles without any difficulty. It would just uh, surprise me. I just thought it was the, the method. You know, you breathe into your tube. Very awkward. <laughs> As most people can. Yeah, thank you. Sarah, you want to add something? No, I want to ask Dawn a question. When you were talking about modifying the body's capacity or potential to, for inflammation and having too much inflammation going on and getting bad, bad outcomes from that. Um, we, also, we hear a lot about uh, eating foods with three omega or something or uh, different types of fats in it that are supposed to be good for this. Is there potential for the food we eat to be good or bad for the body's inflammation potential? Yes, unfortunately it would be nicer if there was a drug we could take or a pill we could take to lower our inflammation, but actually the two best things you can do to lower your inflammation are actually regular exercise and uh, the Mediterranean type diet. So a diet high in uh, plant oils and uh, fish and lots of fruits and vegetables and low in uh, processed meat and, and all the things that taste good. Um, are actually the best, uh, the only ways to show in to lower basal levels of inflammation. Uh, reliably, although there's a number of uh, clinical trials going on to test different diet interventions and that sort of thing. It, oh, it, a hearty dose, it is the Mediterranean diet after all. No, red wine is, is, is still good for us, thank God. There's another question here. <laughs> um, hello, I was just wondering where um, sarcoidosis fits in with what you've been discussing tonight and if it doesn't, how one would learn about it. Um, sarcoidosis actually fits into the family of lung tissue diseases um, traditionally, however it can also affect the airway and it can affect parts of the body outside the chest in about 15 to 20 percent of, of patients. So sarcoidosis is actually quite a, it's a commoner condition than the ones I was talking about. It also is a more benign condition. Uh, 80 percent of people with sarcoidosis have a benign illness that does not require treatment. And of those who do require treatment, we actually have very effective therapies to offer. So sarcoidosis, while it's a cousin of pulmonary fibrosis, is a completely different uh, condition. It's caused by overactivity of the immune system. So this inflammation that Don and, and Carl were talking about, where there's problems with overactivity in the immune system causing tissue damage, that's what happens in sarcoidosis. We actually have very good treatments because we know what the inflammation is doing and we know what's organizing it and we're able to intervene and prevent it uh, quite well. So I would say that uh, I would expect 
uh, 90, 95% of our patients with sarcoidosis to actually have a good outcome, whereas I wouldn't have any optimism like that for our patients with lung cancer or for our patients with lung fibrosis. Okay, thank you. When you talk about treatments, are they steroid-based or are there other we ones? We usually start with steroids because they're the, one of the most powerful um, anti-inflammatory drugs that we have, and prednisone also has, I mean, the list of how it works is as long as your arm, which is great. So you don't know exactly which of its actions is useful in, every, in the patients using it, but you know something's working from prednisone. And then we work our way through a list of probably four second-line drugs to help the prednisone do its job. And if they don't work, we have a third line drug, which is a very specific but powerful inhibitor of one of the substances that, that Carl knows about, tumor necrosis factor. Uh, that's a key mediator in causing sarcoid-related re inflammation. And anti-TNF drugs can be very effective if the other drugs don't work. Thank you. I see there's a couple of questions coming. Yes, thank you, and uh, good to see you again. You too. <laughs> yeah, I'm in that study too. I'm not doing too well. <laughs> um, there were four enlightening presentations. They were, they were really riveting. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm sorry, I don't write fast enough, so I've got a couple questions to clarify. And Dr. Bodish, when you had one slide, you said recognizing the symptoms. And one was run down, but the next one says it was lack of fever. It didn't make sense. How could a lack of fever be a symptom? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's true. It's a cha that's challenging. So I guess what I'm trying to say is with infectious disease, if you go to your family doctor or whatever, the higher your fever is, the more seriously they take that as an infection. That's a, a standard marker um, for an infection. But for reasons we don't entirely understand, as we get older, our fever response gets less and less. So if you had a raging fever for three days, you'd probably understand that you were sick and you needed some medical help and you'd go to the doctor. But the problem is, as we get older, we don't have good fever responses. So instead of you know, having that really obvious knowing that you're sick feeling, instead it's more of a creeping unwellness. Um, and so that's one of the reasons people often don't get diagnosed quickly enough, just because they don't have that sort of glaring obvious sign of illness as we get older. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Richards, um, again, I was, I was trying to write down fast, and you said 30% of all Canadians will die of cancer? That's correct, yes. Yeah, and then, and then the next stat was 27% of Canadians will die of lung. Is it 27% of Canadians will die, or 27% of the cancer will be lung? Uh, no, it's 27% of those with cancer. Will, Not of Canadians. 27% of Canadians would be an awful lot of people, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so 27% of those people with cancer will die of That's, lung cancer. Yeah, okay, thank you. And 30% of people in Canada who die will die of a cancer of some sort. Right, and then. You. It's 27% of that. Mm -hmm. So it works out to be about whatever, you know, 30 times 30. So about 8 to 9% of Canadians will be dying. No, sorry. 8% of those people who do die, mm -hmm. die of lung cancer. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And just to confirm what we were saying before, and I'm, I'm an asthma victim for, for years and years, did I just hear you say that, you know, really good exercise and good diet are, are essential to cope with that too, eh? That's good. <laughs> yes, uh, well, I, sadly, those are the only things that have been proven to be helpful are good diet and good exercise. But this is one of the reasons why managing chronic inflammatory conditions is so important, because sometimes that can be something that prevents people from getting the exercise they need. So, for example, someone who's got uh, COPD is going to have to deal with different challenges uh, and finding ways of still being active. So it's important um, if we do have any of the, any conditions that prevent us from getting exercise to really have a good health care plan or a practitioner who can help us work around whatever our obstacles are for that. I, I was I was actually just curious in relation to that question. I saw Dr. Cox smiling, so I'd like to get his view on it, why he was smiling on that one. Well, I, if, if I understand correctly, the question said has something to do with, uh, did you mention asthma? Okay, so when there is a restriction on lung function, when there's a lung disease that stops your lungs from doing what you would like them to do, <clears throat> We can't really increase lung capacity. 
We'd like it if we could, but we can't. That's a hope, that's not a reality. And the programs that Carol was talking about, breathworks, pulmonary rehabilitation, that are very effective in helping people become more active and to feel better. I think probably the simplest way to describe it is a bit like bringing your car for a tune-up. Your car isn't doing very well, <clears throat> It's not getting very good gas mileage, doesn't have much pickup. You bring it to the garage, the guy fixes things, cleans out the pipes or whatever, redoes the spark plugs and that. The, your engine isn't any bigger. The capacity is no bigger, but your car runs much more efficiently, much more effectively, and more like it should have been before. And that's what exercise does with your lungs. It doesn't increase their capacity, but it gives you much more bang for your buck so that each breath goes further. You go further with each breath by being more efficient as a result of exercising. I also want to add about the importance of exercise related to muscle wasting. Because when you have a muscle and you don't use that muscle, it just gets worse. So it's really important to keep active and to keep... So if you can walk today, continue to walk forever. Anyways, I, I'm not sure how many of you were here a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Sir Muir Gray was here talking about the fitness gap. There is a normal curve for aging, and then there is a fitness gap that puts you at risk for developing many uh, chronic conditions. So, and I think that's the same concept we are talking about here as well. Next question, okay. please. My name is Doreen Johnson, and um, I started to have shortness of breath. Um, I don't have COPD, and as a matter of fact, I don't know what I've, I have. But these symptoms are um, something that have just started. I recall that in the month of May, I did have some shortness of breath and was asked to do that breathing um, uh, test. Um, I don't recall that my physician had given me anything, uh, any medication or, or anything of, at all. What has brought this on again? I am going overseas and I had the pneumonia um, vaccine and I noticed that I'm sort of having some chills sometimes and um, and this shortness of breath. I do, I've never been told that I have asthma or any of those kinds of things and I'm really not sure what it is. Now I'm going tomorrow to take the test again, the, I don't remember the name that you call. Yeah, and um, to take the test. So I'm really concerned when I saw this was sent to me, I was really concerned as to, I thought it maybe it's my medication, even though I only take two medications, and um, that is causing this. Um, so and I don't smoke. I'm not around people who smokes. So I'm at a loss to know what is causing the breathing. To, I exercise, I just came today from, I'm a member of the YWCA and I just came today. And I noticed as was said, when I exercise, I can walk, I can breathe a little better. I don't have as much shortness, but um, I, I don't know. I don't know what is really happening with me. Uh, I just wondered from so telling you that whether you... Where are you going to have the breathing test done? Um, I don't remember. It's a place in, on James Street in Hamilton. Okay, well, <clears throat> I work in St. Joseph's Hospital in the Firestone Institute for Spiritual Health. So if you're going there tomorrow, I'll be in clinic all day, and you can ask me, and I'll tell you the results of your breathing test, because I'm reporting the breathing test this week, so I'll be looking at it if it's done in St. Joe's. So that's just, <laughs> a, just a, a possible so you'll get a special care tomorrow. benefit <laughs> if you happen to come to St. Joe's for your breathing test tomorrow. I'll be there uh, looking at them. Um, th so this is the challenge that... Um, 
you know, family doctors face every day, which is trying to pick out of all the different conditions. And you heard this evening about three different things, all of which could cause you to be short of breath. Um, and you know, which one is it? Or is it any of those or something completely different? And in the app, without having testing, it's very difficult to know which chapter of the book we should be reading to find out what's wrong and what to do. And um, of people who have shortness of breath, in general, a half or maybe a little more than half actually have a lung or airway condition. Quite a lot of people don't have an airway condition or a lung condition at all. They have something else that's making them short of breath. And there's a whole list of things that can do it. You mentioned medications. They can do it. Taking too much aspirin can do it because it changes acid levels. Having other condition, other illnesses of some kind can do it. Having weakness of the muscles will make you an effort intolerant, which your brain will say is shorter, shortness of breath. So it gets complicated. If it isn't simple, which it sounds like it's not, because you've had it for a while, you've talked to your doctor about it, and it hasn't been easy to tell from talking. When it isn't simple, it gets complicated fairly quickly. And that's why the way out of that complication, or the way, the way to get through that complication, is through testing the breathing, which is what you've got lined up, and then a chest x-ray. That's a very simple, easily accessible test. And those two things, plus a conversation with somebody who knows about breathlessness, gets to the bottom of most of the situations. So that's how I would think I'd see how this works out. Get the breathing test done. If it shows a breathing problem, well, then that can be pursued, investigated, and managed. And if it shows nothing wrong with your lungs, well, then we have to go to a different chapter of the book altogether from lung disease and look for other things that can make people feel uncomfortable with their breathing. The only difficulty with this is that I'm due to leave the country. I'm going away for a month and here it is. Um, I can breathe properly. So I suppose, I don't know. That is a challenge. Yes, it is. <laughs> Thank you for Unless the you come to St. Joe's, we'll fix uh, you tomorrow. We will take uh, maybe, okay, there's another question. Hi, I'm Kathy. Uh, this is a fantastic session, and I thank you very much for it. My question is, how important is it for every householder to have a radon test in the basement? Radon is the um, second, um, second leading cause of lung cancer, uh, is from radon. Uh, therefore, I would encourage you to um, go pick up a radon kit. Uh, you can get them at um, hardware stores like Canadian Tire and those other hardware stores, and and check check for check your home. I, I, it's definitely worth worth it. Carl, do you want to add something? Yeah, I think uh, I think I read statistics a little while ago talking about U.S. homes. One in 15, apparently, in U.S. homes have above the recommended levels of radon. Um, so it, 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 it's something to think about. Um, radon is a decomposition um, product from uranium, and, and, and uh, it's in the natural Earth's crust, uh, but it can actually accumulate in certain spots and others, so that's why there's certain geographical areas that are higher in radon than others. Um, so uh, it, it might be worth considering. Radon is the second leading cause of lung cancer. Uh, far lower, of course, than smoking, but, but it is the second rate. And there's a lot of other lung uh, risks for lung cancer um, uh, that are, are really a very low risk, but they are a somewhat of a risk. So, uh, but radon is the second most, right? So we'll take uh, two more questions before we sort of uh, mingle and chat. So, please. Hi, I'm Heather Yule. I've been doing a cat allergy test at MAC, and through it I was recently di diagnosed with asthma, and I've always considered myself very healthy, but I've always recognized that my lungs were my weakest point. I've never been treated for asthma. I didn't know previously that I had it, but I'm wondering, given all this talk about inflammation, whether now that I know that I've got very mild asthma, should I be treating it to a prevent further inflammation? Um. <laughs> um, maybe. Uh, so asthma is a common condition. Uh, it has 
certain elements that are recognised by us and measured by us, but people have different amounts of those factors in their asthma. So we know there are people who can have a lot of inflammation and a little breathing problem, or people can have a big breathing problem and a little amount of inflammation, that even though they go together, they're not tightly bound. So if you wanted to know about your levels of inflammation, well, then they would need to be measured. I don't think you can make, a, you can't make a confident connection between a diagnosis of asthma and having inflammation in your body that's bad from Dr. Bodish's point of view, uh, bad inflammation. So, and there are ways to measure it. Okay, so I, do I approach my family doctor? Do I go see Dr. Bodish? <laughs> 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 Just bring your arm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, like Dr. Cox said, the, the link between the age associated inflammation and asthma is actually very weak, and actually, asthmatics generally have a long and healthy uh, prognosis, especially if they're treated. So, I would say, um, you know, I, I'm not a physician, so I can't uh, recommend this, but I would say you would talk to someone like uh, Dr. Cox about the asthma and make sure that wasn't impeding your life, but your age-associated inflammation and aging trajectory is probably completely independent of your asthma. But if you want to come and give blood, by all means, we'll, uh, we, we're always taking new donors. Okay. We'll, we'll take one more question. We're recruiting for you. <laughs> um, could a uh, medication uh, prescribed for a totally unrelated medical issue cause an underlying undiagnosed respiratory problems come to the forefront to the point of being in intensive care for several weeks, the lungs completely harden, and nothing more that the doctors could, could do. Yes. And this drug, this drug was prescribed for a bladder infection, and it was macrobid. And afterwards, finding all the the information from the drugstore, it does clearly state that it can cause respiratory problems in rare circumstances, respiratory problems to the point of death. And that's, ex well, and we also suspect that she did have a non-diagnosed underlying lung problems because it has been brought, it's, it's we found out that it's in our family, so. So, so somewhere on one of the slides I had was something that referred to that, pro that type of problem, drug-related, that we prescribe medications to do good in one part, and unfortunately, there's a sting in the tail that they have a, this occasional, happily rare, but we, rec we see it every year, um, the capacity to cause lung injury. Usually, when there's something else going on in the lung, and the two things together vault into disease, um, and yes, it does happen, yeah, and we, happily it's rare, we do and you can't tell who yeah, is going no, to get it. No. We do suspect that, but, but it wasn't diagnosed. But, you know, that's what, that, you know, her daughters are convinced that it was strictly the drug, but we, we think that it was underlying issues. So. Great. Thank you very much. I want to take opportunity to thank our panelists for a wonderful, stimulating discussion here and to all of you for participating in this discussion and asking some really wonderful questions. And hopefully this was a uh, enlightening and informative session for uh, all of you. And it was for me especially because I don't know anything about this area of, of uh, health. And I also wanted to take opportunity to thank Lung Association for sponsoring this event. And, and there are some of the people here. Don actually played a major role in organizing this. So I'd like to uh, say special thanks to Don and Carol, yourself as well, and Sue and uh, Laura Lawson, who's gone on to have a new baby who's not here. She was very instrumental in organizing. And some of the staff from the, uh, from the Lung Association who are at the back. Uh, thank you very much. So we are coming at the end of this uh, session. At this point, we are going to wrap up the formal part, and we would like to uh, ask you to hang out, have some snacks that are on the uh, back of the room. And if you have any further questions that you didn't get a chance to ask or were shy coming to the mic, some of the speakers will be hanging around for a few minutes. So with that, thank you very much. Enjoy your evening. and. Uh,